Berlin conjures up his past like no other city does. He's lived here for nine years, but the specters that keep returning to it are from all over. So he decides to write them into his text, making it porous, as porous as he finds the city. No wonder his writing saunters in and out of Berlin with little outcry, yet it also dwells, turning dense ever so slowly in the traffic of dreams, memories, imaginations, and anxieties. So, he seeks in his writings the accumulated weight of these presents, just as much such writing constellates multiple histories that do not usually get told together. Eventually, he will come to see how he is implicated in the passages he writes, for what is the migrant's act of writing the city if not in engaging with the city as a complicated home? But for now, when he refers to himself in the third person, not I, but he, he follows Kathleen Stewart's idea of gaining distance from one's own subjectivity in these scenes, while recording at the same time the privileges and particularities that inhere in his class-specific, migrant, and cisgender ways of inhabiting Berlin. The texts he writes are not about him, though he's integral to their compositions. In a way, these act like artists near <coughs> Petrodurian's lavatory self-portraits in the Flemish style, which are not selfies, as she claims, but other portraits of the self. A lyrically buoyant circle of men has come to a still. Chants and recitations, odd screams and intermittent howls are no more, but the air is pregnant with its resonances. There is a sense of nascent repose. Smells of fragrant oils linger on, even if in less pungent forms, as sweat soften the contours of men's bodies, mostly men in their 20s who until moments ago were oscillating on their feet, singing hallowed praises, swaying rhythmically left to right and back to left, their forearms locked with one another, but no more. Tired, sweaty, overcome with feelings, the men are now seated on the carpeted floor, gasping. The puff and pant of heavy breathing is fairly audible, their bodies not upright like moments ago, but curled up such that their heads almost meet the ground. Forty minutes of an intense ritual are now over in a room in Neukölln, longer than it is wide and oriented obliquely towards Mecca. A five-minute walk from where he lives is a mosque. He goes there every week, where 25 to 30 men gather around a sheikh who leads them into zikr, the Sufi performance of mindful <coughs> remembrance of Allah. In circles of godly remembrance, the men are young and Turkish-German, sons of Gastarbeiters. When they sing and chant, laugh and cry, move and are moved, or simply fall to the ground, they remember and long with their bodies. Some of these men tell him that there are other persons in the circle, ones that he cannot see, and that when, with their eyes shut, they sing and chant praises of saints and holy men, holy men and saints appear. Intimacies take hold, even if only in passing. There is a woman he sees almost every day. From where he usually sits outside this cafe on the street where he lives, there is but just a line of three potted plants that separate the cafe from the Shveti, where she sits sipping tea. And just now, as he is jotting down these lines, a man from across this plant line reaches out to him. Hassan from Morocco introduces himself and inquires a little bit about him too. Ich komme aus Pakistan, he says in German. In this moment, his eyes meet the eyes of the woman, but they do not exchange greetings. They will kill my father. Hassan's next words leave him stunned as he quotes Benazir Bhutto out of the blue from a TV interview aired on the BBC sometime in the late 1970s. Affected as he is, he's immediately thinking about how a mere soundbite was enough to recollect an entire history. Hassan raises his hand towards his heart, shaking it to tell him how those words still stir his emotions. He also tells him that he lives right above the Shpeti. Even after he thinks the conversation is long finished, Hassan keeps interrupting his daily ritual of writing, offering, offering German cultural trivia, like how to end an email in German. MFG, he recommends from across the plants, mit freundlichen Grüßen. 
He sees him again, this time after three months. He is 3.2 kilometers away. He closes the app on his iPhone without clicking. His heart longs for him still, he realizes. When Hassan asked him if he could join him at his table, the potted divide felt a lot more real to him. Mixed as it is here in this neighborhood, dog-owning, breakfast-eating, coffee-drinking Yukis or young urban creative internationals as the guardians once described Berliners of Neukölln hardly mingle with those that leisurely hang outside Spätis, speaking Arabic, Turkish, Romanian and whatnot. Yet certain intimacies <coughs> were inevitable. For instance, on other days, when looking out from this cafe, framed by its window front, he sees passers-by, possibly his neighbors, ones that are routinely caught in fleeting passages. For example, this woman, dressed in shalwar kameez, dragging a wheeled bag of groceries. Every time he sees her, he tries to quickly piece together the finer details of the cursory scene, like the length of her kameez or the precise cut of her garment, all cues that he thinks will lead him to assess whether she might be Pakistani or Indian, possibly even Bangladeshi. He's of the conviction that Pakistanis dress better, but that's beside the point. These neighbors, he notes, never stop at cafes. They hardly peek in. They just keep walking on. Right across is another cafe, tad fancier than this one, where the coffee is 20 cents more expensive and candles in dark interiors peek out of large windows even during the day. Tables are hard to get, especially outside, even though, unlike a Parisian cafe, there isn't much going on to gaze upon. A kinderwagen pushing mother stops by to chat with the dog owner, a scene of likely white intimacy, he thinks. Breakfasts continue, the light drizzle too. The leisure of cafes is palpably different from leisures of a shpeti, it suddenly dawns upon him. He's immediately reminded of his hatred for zucchini cakes, which so often announced the hipsterness of cafes. There's one like that on the other street where the coffee costs 50 cents more, where ashram pans upend the outline of headscarves, vegan sandwiches frown at kebabs of the Keats. Annoyed by the thought, he returns to the scene that is now, back where cheese platters and bread baskets stop at potted lines. So does the eclectic style of mismatching furniture. But not always are potted lines legible, he thinks. By night, on the same street, candlelit bars glimmer unlike game rooms, whose fluorescent glow outs them as men's only migrant spaces. He never goes there. I decided to fly to Australia. I left my boyfriend, emoticon sad face. Late one night, in a WhatsApp message from Bali, his Italian neighbor informs him, informs him of the breakup. He sounds composed but hurt, defeated almost. The next morning he meets his neighbor's ex to receive the keys to the apartment who explains to him which of the keys are to which of the doors, which of the plants require more water, which not. He's never been good with plants so he nervously listens, trying to catch every detail even though he's clearly distracted. All this while wondering why the hot German stranger he thinks he's never met looks oddly familiar. As they walk out, the neighbor's ex hands the keys over. He sounds composed, but hurt, almost defeated. Turning the corner of the street, he hears him say, please don't tell him about us. To bring memoir to bear on geography, is to consider how time binds the narration of one life to the many affective mappings of a city. Such writing is an aching for one's own histories to stick and sediment in new places through the labor of memory, or remembering through writing that what might feel distant, possibly dismembered. Through thin, he looks for traces, sensitivities, continuities which are otherwise implausible, between ostensibly straight pasts and queer futures, between men and saints in Berlin, between the bedroom and the mosque. Through intimacy, he searches for echoes that might evolve or emerge between delicacies of religious ritual and precarities of queer love. Thin attachments, it follows, are attachments 
that don't stick, that do not last, yet they bear a spectral depth, their charge lives on, returning, unfolding in other forms, arresting us ever so tenuously. Es schneit in Berlin, die Temperatur ist 3 Grad unter Null. Plain, quiet, unembellished, he is taken by the solitude he finds in the opening images of Aras Urban's 1973 book-length poem, Was will Niazi in der Naunienstraße? He reads on, Die Naunienstraße ist zugefroren, ihre Häuser sind fertig zum Aufwachen. The scene of this street in Berlin-Kreuzberg exists as though both within and outside Berlin, where it is winter and it is autumn, when Niazi Gemüskilic geht, geht mit schnellen Schritten wie Mitte September zum Blaufischfang in der Bucht von Berlin. <coughs> but September in Bebeck doesn't last, not even in the poem. Back on the frozen street, just when his German neighbor Frau Kutzer kommt schwer in Schlaf, he goes with swift steps to the night shift. Scenes like these of Gastarbeiter life in Oren's poem are imbued with competing temporalities. An empty, linear, and measured time <coughs> produced by capitalism and its queer counterpart, a time filled with invisible migrant labors, dreams, and aspirations. Like workers of night shifts, he thinks, saints exist in a parallel city. In a place as insufficiently sacralized as Berlin, saints are also migrants of some kind, subject to time, without history or residence permits, invisible to many, slithering across spaces, escaping intelligibility, present only to those who are willing to see with eyes shut. He has been reading Diane Chisholm. Her reading of the gay bathhouse points to the ways in which the labyrinthine logic of cruising for sex mimics the architecture of the city in a way that it interiorizes the passages and meeting places of the external city, makes contact among city goers safe, yet retains, in fact, magnifies its cruising potentials and desirous contours, a kind of expanding, even testing, of the Erwartungshorizont of the city. He loves this German word he had recently picked up. It, re it literally means the horizon of expectations. But such inversion has extraneous impacts. Men emerging from the interiorized urbanity of the gay bathhouse return to the city transformed with deeper knowledge, both of their bodies and the city, a kind of knowledge that renders them even more skilled and adept at cruising the city. It all sounds expectedly familiar to him, in fact, he had already begun thinking of whether or not what the young men did during Zikr could be read in terms of a form of cruising, a cruising for saints, as he had noted down in his field notes. At first he didn't know why he wished to photograph the bed. It wasn't his own, it wasn't his either. Perhaps it was the whiteness doubled by that of his German lover or its hotel-like anonymity that had struck something in him. Its white sheets came with an Airbnb in Barcelona. Each morning, as they got out of it, he felt that in unmaking the bed through the night, they had made it their own. Where does one look for traces of a migrant body amid so much whiteness, he would wonder years later, as the streets of Bolzano would remind him, day after day. Back at the Airbnb, intimacy was no longer abstract, but a concrete thing pressing upon fabric. <coughs> Affect had a way of imprinting itself, not just on bodies. It was finding its way in that spot where the mattress sagged just a wee bit, in the crumpled sheets willowing with ghost-like presence, in the disheveled feathers full of gossip inside pillows. He wouldn't have articulated what he was feeling in these exact terms just then, but he knew as much that what he saw was all the same and yet not the same. Creases, folds, volumes of intimacy and sunlight were all unique. Once he would himself out-crease, fold up, cover, flatten, making the bed each morning so that it could return to its anonymous white self. This wasn't destined to be furniture without memories, 
Toni Morrison's phrase that Avery Gordon repurposes to describe the effects of those rituals, habits, structures, and behaviors whose history we do not ask for, so ingrained in our ways of being that we never pause to question their purpose. This, he reckoned, was furniture with memory. Imprints he knew he wanted to return to long after the queer folds of nine nights had been straightened out, morning after morning, ready, almost waiting, as if for other bodies of color to arrive, take cover in its whiteness. There were days when he was reminded how German, imperfect as it was in his case, had settled into his ordinary ways of speaking. One has lived far too long in Deutschland, he once declared to his friends on Facebook, when one replaces intransitive words with machen, unfortunately in English, and to its further detriment when one inadvertently closes one's sentences with an open-ended word like all, just like Germans use Odo. And then, that Kleinen moment of horror when he wondered if one day he too will sound like the refrain from Tracy Ullmann's parody of Angela Merkel, Oh my God, I'm rolling my eyes. He stood at the counter at Rewe asking for 100 grams of roast beef. Though he had done so in German, he had caught himself, like so many times before, Germanizing his English words. He had learned to make these little adjustments for the benefit of his listeners. He hadn't arrived at this decision consciously. It had, as if of its own will, crept into his ways of being in the city. It had often lent his German a certain kind of authenticity, the kind that comes with not pronouncing English words in any English way. So, on that day, as he stood before the counter, he asked for roast beef, when in fact he had meant roast beef. Despite his German enunciation of the word, the German man at the counter picks the wrong sort of meat, the one he hadn't asked for, as if his generous gesture of Germanizing was entirely lost on him. Disappointed, he uttered the same words again, this time pointing to the roast beef, to which the guy responded, das ist aber roast beef. This time, like Merkel, he just rolled his eyes. And though he did roll his eyes in English, he was confident it couldn't be lost in translation. English, he was eine kleine bit happy. He had often wondered how he would feel if men from the mosque would run into him in the Keats, where lovers like him were known to kiss on street corners, genau wie im Film. On a Thursday in February, many moons later, just when he was engrossed in his daily ritual of writing in the cafe, he saw walking towards him not men from the circle, but the sheikh himself. He couldn't believe his eyes, so he looked down and then up again, and there he stood with his gentle smile. He had paused to wonder how this was in fact possible in a cafe with zucchini cakes. As he stood up to greet the sheikh, he felt his body shrink, just enough to signal a reverence he had seen other followers give him in the mosque. His head lowered, his body folding inwards. Salam alaikum, they both greeted. Two white women looked up. He spoke with him in German, rare occasions where his German fared better than his fellow speaker, he thought. He feared he might ask him why he hadn't been to the mosque in almost a year. Instead, he told him it was his first time in the cafe. When the sheikh came and sat, sat next to him, his image of passing by neighbors had also cracked a little. There he was, not passing by as other neighbors did, but inside his cafe, his bureau, a place where the mosque and his writing the mosque were eventually crossing paths. It was in search of such dilations and permeations that he had begun to write about the intimacies of the mosque beyond the mosque in the first place. Soon enough, the sheikh would be on his way to a German lesson at the Integrations course right next door. In that moment, he takes a break from writing what he was writing. He knows he must grasp what fades. He writes a scene. Bir eki uç dort, or so counted the young men in Turkish, all as one, keeping score as they took turns doing push-ups. In this almost empty room in Neukölln, there was hardly much left. Just the fervor of voices reverberating off its now bare surfaces 
and cold fluorescent lights that dodged contours of well-toned bodies. The setting, drab with a palpable ease, was almost pallid, yet none of this was routine. Vivid or spirited, too green or painfully yellow, birds that he would have once described the once he would have once used to describe the character of this room were no longer imaginable. The Quranic calligraphy that had long adorned the walls was now buried in multiple coats of white paint. The last cycle of religious chants and haptic rituals was already a faint memory. And even if the elderly sheikh was still in audience, an earlier mood of reverence was no more. In fact, the rolled up carpets on which the men sat had been removed only minutes ago, its coiling as if had unfurled an air of playfulness. One after the other, amid bouts of praise and cheer, the young men showed off their physical prowess, their heavy biceps taut against the concrete floor. In this moment, even the sheikh, who until now only smilingly watched, knew well that at some point he too would have to take the floor. How remarkable were these moments, as he observed the space of the mosque gradually transform from a room of prayer to that of leisure recording it photographically over the span of an evening. The last features of the mosque had been dismantled, an entire mosque and its 15 years put away in boxes. Left behind was a concrete floor that now stood haunted with traces of color. Faint but stubborn vestiges of the carpet had stuck to the floor, a memory far easier to arrest than the many immaterial trails lost to the eye of the camera. Loss as he would eventually come to appreciate, was not a closure, but an opening. Those who apprehend the world and delicacies of the revealed and the hidden know that potentiality is distinct from a thing that simply might happen, that it involves a certain mode of non-being, or that fear, loss, disappointment, indeterminacy are potentialities, affective contours, indispensable to the work of imagining the world otherwise. When Sufis in Neukölln long for the unrevealed, they know well that as much as a tactfully hidden world of saints, spirits, jinns and holy men is at arm's length during zikr, it's not exactly durable outside it, hence present without actually existing in the present tense. As leisure took hold in the room that day, departing from its air were rhythms of the body, sounds of joy and fear, and possibly the saints too, who were known to haunt the room week after week in the past 15 years. Of the last traces of a mosque that the room now bore, this moment of laughter was most fleeting, he had thought, hard to photograph, least likely to stick to its surfaces, lesser still to be carried along in boxes. How do we belong in a sight of loss? He had then asked himself. How do we hold on to its parting knowledge, especially when something comes to an end? From the moment he opened his eyes on that Saturday morning, he knew something was amiss. Even though he had imagined it otherwise, his body had drifted away from his through the course of the night, a tad further apart than it was possible on a 140 meter wide bed. He made him coffee in the morning, they took it in the kitchen, commenting how unremarkable its taste was. When he walked out of the door, he kissed him ever so lightly on the lips, touching only to untouch them again. See you soon, he said, as though it was an inadvertent speech act. He didn't believe him, not one syllable, but he knew that it was the right thing to say in that moment. Later that evening, he stood in a circle with Sufis as they sang praises of saints and holy men. He wondered, like he often did in the circle, how one could see with eyes closed. He sees you, you don't see him, we're all together, it's love, a Sufi follower had once explained to him. That night, as he closed his eyes, eyes he was told were Knopfagen, he too saw, as Sufis would, though not a saint, but him. It ought to have been love indeed. And when at the end of the ritual, the sheikh raised his hands in prayer, he raised his hands too. After a long time, he had caught himself praying, this time for him and him. That week, they drudgingly chatted on WhatsApp. Then on Friday, he received the breakup message, a prayer in the city, 
had not come true. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I was very excited when I was invited to act as a discussant for Omar because in fact I told him already he was a really a gift from heaven in the sense that our uh, research interests really match well together. Uh, Omar also has done intensive uh, fieldwork on a pilgrimage site, a small pilgrimage site, no, in, in Pakistan. Yes, yes. And, um, He's also focusing on gender and religion as, as I have been. And uh, he's using this approach that, well, we will discuss also and say more about here, uh, that is really focusing on intimacy. So I was, um, in this discussion, I will draw on my background in anthropology, but luckily I can also draw on my background in German and English literature, because my BA was in, in literature, because I think that here we really are at, at the crossroads between poetry and uh, uh, anthropology, no? And um, so uh, forgive me if the, the, like, the first things I will do are not so poetic, but more, <laughs> more related to words, mm -hmm. to unpack a bit, to use your term, some, some words, because I think it's, it's really, for me, it would be really interesting how you interpret some words and why you choose, you chose these words, no? So uh, the first, uh, for sure, is a theme. No? So uh, I, I really like this, this, this idea of, of, of thin no? and also the kind of fragility and vulnerability it entails. But this, this is the, the, the first thing I would like to elaborate mm -hmm. upon, exactly to understand if the way I got it is the way you are <laughs> actually using it. I don't want to impose here my vision. No? And, um, the second one would, uh, would be intimacy, mm -hmm. because um, for me it was a bit striking because at the beginning I was saying, okay, intimacy, and then you were speaking about the bedroom and so on, so this was easy to follow, but then at some point you speak also of intimacy in, in the cafe, no? when you say this, this man comes and speaks with you, and uh, and, and you say that at some in the cafes you are sort of forced to have to certain kind of intimacies, but then for me it, it, it would be interesting to understand where do you draw the line, no? How do you establish whether a relationship is intimate or not? Because to be a bit the devil's advocate, we could also ask ourselves whether having sex with somebody necessarily mm -hmm. implies intimacy, because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it depends on how you define it. No? Uh, we, we tend to make this, this, this quick association between sexuality and, and intimacy, but mm. not everybody would agree. No? So I think this would also be very interesting for me. And um, the third word is um, queer, no? in the mm. sense that uh, we spoke a bit about, uh, when we first met about this. No? Uh, the term queer is, is now widely used, and uh, uh, I was wondering first if the, the people you describe no, call themselves queer, mm -hmm. like it would be also interesting to, to know which kind of word they use no, in mm -hmm. German as well, uh, because it is so difficult to, to translate queer. No? Mm -hmm. And also, um, when you use this word uh, uh, describing yourself as cisgender, how do you use uh, this, this word, no? Because, uh, of course, it is, in, it is clear when you're like homosexual that you define yourself as cisgender, but um, in my own research I have come across people, for instance, who consider themselves cisgender even if from the outside they, they are leading a pretty classic uh, heterosexual life because they don't identify with gender roles. Sometimes they also are bisexual, so they had in the past uh, other kind of relationships. So yeah. it's also how, how do you play with, the, with, the, with these words, no? So I think it's better if you answer <laughs> it, then maybe we go on. And also I don't know how you want to do this, but at some point you want to 
step in as well. No, I don't want to mon monopolize. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I mean, these are um, certainly terms that need to be unpacked, uh, but also thinking of, of all these uh, four things, uh, thin intimacy, or th at least three things, thin intimacy and queer, uh, is also a lot of work to do, right? <laughs> um, but thin, yes, I think it's obvious that I, I have this kind of affair with, with the word thin and I keep um, using it in many ways. Um, I can say that it, I started thinking about thin because of my um, thin access to the mosque in the beginning where I was asked to do research, uh, which is also how this project, I always call it, it's a queer accident of a very straight project that I was asked to do. Um, and I was asked to do a research in a mosque community um, and once I started doing this research and I was allowed into the group based on my Muslim name and you know also I think somehow this is my assumption that the community welcomed me knowing that I was also an outsider in that society I was a migrant and I had a Muslim name so it was easier to include me but it also brought these anxieties of how do I write about this ritual which is extremely intimate I'm observing men in a very vulnerable moment and what does it mean as an outsider to write about another outsider community? So those anxieties started to come in. Where I first started to think about, okay, my access is quite thin, which means my German is not perfect. I don't speak a word of Turkish. So we're going to have conversations in German, and I'm going to observe the ritual with my eyes closed, because that's what you do in the ritual. So what am I going to do? So I started thinking of how thin my access was. And then it somehow, because of all these anxieties, I started to think about not watching them doing the ritual, but watching myself watch them. Which then also became about why then only write about the mosque? Why write about the religion, this particular religion, but also about Islam in this kind of um, exclusionary way? Because it feeds into this um, German cultural appetite for what's happening behind closed doors. This whole parallel Gesellschaft uh, discourse. And even if you describe peace-loving Sufis and you know they're doing funny things that the Germans might find interesting and exotic, well, it's still a question of distance. So I was, I was nervous about these things and so the project became about my relationship to the mosque and then also my relationship with the neighborhood, to the city, and then I started writing about all these things in a way. So thin became so that's how I got into thin, I would say. But then thin became, for me, it became this question of porosity. It became this idea of how can you... Because I was, I was drawing these parallels between spaces that were otherwise not speaking to each other. How do you make your bedroom speak to the mosque? How do you make a mosque speak to a cafe? How do you make a cafe speak to a cruising bar or a sex club, right? Um, so thin as a figure of affect allowed me to think about all the kinds of porosities that were possible in the city in terms of memories, in terms of imaginations, in terms of remembering because when I started writing about the city I realized that as attached I was to Berlin I was, Berlin was also being, for me, my Berlin was also about other places somehow haunting uh, my, my, my place in the city so I was also writing about other places that I was traveling to or had come from so there were all these, this question of memory and this affective porosity of the city that was very important to me. So Thin also became that. And then when I started to write in fragments, I realized that Thin is also has to do with the form somehow. Because when you write in this non-linear, fragmented way, for the reader, it allows you to go from one scene to the other. You can make your own connections. There's also porosity in the text, I think. So Thin operates on a number of levels. Thin also is, what I say, is the space for the hauntological urban, so, which means the haunted city, the city which is visited by saints. So this was the other thing, the conversations I was having with Sufis was about these interactions and encounters, very emotional and affective encounters that they were having with spirits and jinns and, and these, these uh, more than human beings from the from the 13th century, from the 15th century, from Baghdad, from Medina, from all these places. So the city was already quite thin in that sense. The city had multiple temporalities. So it was also, it also becomes a way to critique the secular, godless, linear, progressive time as we know it. Um, so when you think 
of this parallel level of the city which is haunted by ghosts and saints and spirits and there's no restriction of time and space and these, you know, there's this, this level which is quite porous, I thought. So Thin allows me to do all these things, in a way. Um, so that's maybe the answer to Thin. Intimacy, I think intimacy goes back to my previous project as well. So the work that I do in Pakistan, uh, which as, as Anna mentioned, is about a pilgrimage town, and I write about life histories of women, men, and transgender individuals who uh, become closer to a saint, uh, in my reading. But these are actually ascetics. These are fakirs, as they're called. These are individuals who are usually in academia read as people who take a distance from the world, who renounce the world. And I'm quite interested in looking at how they world, actually. Rather than unworld, they actually world. My argument is that in drawing nearer to saints, in finding intimacy with saints, they are able to find a place in the world rather than rejecting the world. Because these are individuals who begin, as they become intimate with the saints, they begin to question uh, straight norms of society, they begin to question their marriages, they begin to question reproduction, economy, inheritance, all forms of belonging, and they kind of queer, I don't use queer in that word, but I say they find unstraight futures or unstraight worldings, worldings that are not the norm. And they find it through an intimacy with saints. So intimacy is something that I'm quite interested um, in looking at intimacy as something that um, allows for other kinds of futures, allows for other kinds of, um, or also how intimacy endures. So thin attachments, so going back, you know, one of the things that thin attachments does is that it talks about these intimacies, which do not, as I say, they do not stick, they do not last, but they endure in some ways, because they keep returning. They might return as a ghost, they might return as something that haunts, a lover that haunts, a sex state that you can never forget, um, or other kinds of ways in which it is a present figure, it's unfinished business. And yet it's not intimacy in a way that is, it is a formal relationship, it's a love relationship that you're living, you're experiencing. But it has a kind of a future. Right? It, it endures in some ways. So I'm very, in my, <laughs> maybe this is too abstract, but generally across my work, I'm interested in how intimacy endures. Not only in the moment that we live or experience intimacy, but as an afterlife. What happens after intimacy? So this work, as I would say, is a work on public intimacy. I, I'm interested in how, what are the public forms of coming close and what, what happens in those moments. But public forms are also not sort of completely divorced from very personal, intimate moments. But you're right that there is a distinction between just coming near and being intimate. And there, I would say that the, 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 the question that, that uh, changes um, an ordinary coming close or transforms an ordinary coming close into intimacy is a question of affect. Uh -huh. It's affective nearness. It's not just nearness. N being near to something with, while affect is involved, affect and emotion is involved, is intimacy to me. Mm -hmm. um, but intimacy, I would stress is also not transformation. So it's not, it's not a kind of coming close which is losing, losing the self. This is also one of the arguments I use for Sufi intimacy or saintly intimacy because if you read the work on Sufis, it's about annihilation. It's about losing yourself in the divine. That's the standard literature mm -hmm. on Sufism that the ultimate goal of the Sufi is to transform into this divine being, is to forget everything about yourself. What intimacy allows me to talk about is the moment before that. Because intimacy, for intimacy to matter, two bodies have to be separate. Intimacy can only function, endure, thrive, in a condition of nearness, not in a condition of sameness. Right? Mm -hmm. So, the, the people I write about in Pakistan, for example, I'm, I'm switching between projects, but just to say that these, there are these continuities. 
are close enough to the saint for, for them to make something out of that near this relation, this affective nearness, mm -hmm. this unstrained futuring that I say. But it's not, it's not so close that they're no longer separate bodies, right? So I'm not interested in the discourse of losing yourself in God in annihilation, and, because then it is about renouncing the world, and you're no longer the self, and there's nothing, the, the person is not important, and the world is not important. My argument is completely different. I'm saying these are individuals who want to be in the world, um, but they use intimacy as a way to, to have very unstraight lives, in a way. So I think that's to answer my way of... And quickly to say something about queer is just to highlight that I, I'm interested in queer potentialities rather than queer identities. So I'm not calling these people queer. I'm trying to understand queer dynamics in these situations. Right? Mm -hmm. So by imagining intimacies with saints in these rituals, I think a certain linear sense of time of the city, a certain temporality of the city gets queered. So I'm talking about queer potential of intimacies rather than calling these individuals queer. I don't call them queer at all. At no point I call them that these are queer people, for example. So in that sense I'm interested in queer potentials and worldings rather than in an identitarian LGBT sense. Thanks a lot, especially the, the part of um, intimacy is really related to, uh, to my work. Mm -hmm. And uh, because when I speak with pilgrims who arrive to Fatima, they arrive, uh, they are Portuguese and they walk three or four days from their hometowns to, to Fatima, they always speak about this intimacy of arriving to Fatima to see their mother, because for them Our Lady mm -hmm. of Fatima is their mother, no? so there is this whole intimacy with, the, with Our Lady. And there are also all these uh, invisible entities. And, yes. and I, was, I wanted to ask yourself whether when you speak about these invisible entities, and also your Sufi informants, if they only speak about like saints, or if they also speak, for instance, about other humans who are not present, who may be dead or not, like in the, they are migrants, no? Mm, yes. And so yeah. maybe there are family members who are not in Germany and whom they feel are present there as well, or they are former parts of this group who are there as well. Mm. Or if you kind of put this into this room, would you say would you say that here there are presences that are haunting, that are maybe like uh, people who were involved in Lungomara before who are no longer involved but who are still here in some way, or if somebody just had a, had a baby, the baby is in some way present, mm. do you stretch it like this or do you really refer it only to Mm. To, to the saints, how do you use it and how do your informants mm. use it when they are there with their eyes closed, who is there with them? Mm. You know? Very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know there's this, you know, uh, in terms of this interest in the non-human and more than human is, is I think in, in scholarship it's quite, uh, it's quite trendy right now also. It's a good time to talk about ghosts and spirits and <laughs> other forms of uh, life. Um, strictly speaking, my interlocutors uh, only mention dreams, jinns. So dreams from, could be from uh, deceased loved ones, um, or a shape, uh, you know. They talk, and, and they talk about saints in the ritual, so what they see. And so they talk about angels, Jinns, saints, and dreams. Mm -hmm. These are the figures that come up, strictly speaking. Um, and I kind of don't broaden it to speak about... Somehow in the world so far I've not spoken about the secular ghosts or, um, yeah, or other forms of presences, for example. But I think through my own uh, recollections, so 
I do talk about dreams, imaginations, memories, uh, but not in terms of other ghosts and, and specters somehow. But it's not a conscious decision to not do it, but it's just not, it hasn't expanded to that level, I would say. But there's certainly room to, to build on this, I would say, and to, to include um, other forms of presences. Because if you want to talk about the city and its ontological or its spectral dimension, uh, the work is not necessarily just about the mosque, right? This particular thin attachment is not about the mosque. The mosque pops it, keeps popping up. It is, it is there. I'm interested in engaging that as a, as a geography, into the geography of the city. But it is not only really about that. So there's certainly room for secular ghosts, I would say, or post-secular ghosts. No, I'm asking because you, when you describe the fact that when you close your eyes, you see this, this other guy now. Mm, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and so when you describe it, it's like, this is what I felt. I may be yeah, wrong, yeah. but mm. it's like you feel a bit guilty that you are not seeing a saint and you are seeing, <laughs> you know? But in my experience with, my, with the pilgrims, this is very common as well, mm. that it is like, we as researchers tend to assume that they, they only commune with the saints and with very holy yes, things. Yes, of course. But very often these are family members or people they are in love with. So uh, this is why I was yeah, asking this question. Really, yeah. I mean, maybe your experience is mm. not so strange and maybe others were having it as well and you just assumed that yeah. yours was different. That's a very good point. That's a very, Because I think... It's right, I think sometimes, and of course not, interlocutors don't tell you everything, right? Sometimes you might have not asked the right question and hence you will not get to that information. And because they haven't said something doesn't mean that they haven't experienced that. For example, as you said, they might be thinking of other people who are alive also, but just not in the room, or their loved ones, like me. Like, and so, but they may not find the comfort to speak to me about it. But it's interesting that when they talk about intimacy with saints, a lot of them compare it to their love for their wives or their, you know, the women that they loved. And some, like one of the interviews, the, the description, like this guy described Zikr in, the, in terms of an orgasm. Mm -hmm. And I found that really interesting because I was thinking, okay, I'm not the only one bringing sex into the mosque, <laughs> right? <laughs> there are other people doing that too. So it's like, so, so, so sometimes you, you, you um, have these ways to think about what else might be a, a, a body of reference for them, or mm -hmm. you know, what, might, what else might be might be referenced during the ritual, perhaps. So it's a very, yeah, I, I totally see what you mean. Yeah, it's, I mean, I have found this a lot, that we, have, we still, even as researchers, tend to assume that sexuality and religion are separated, mm. but for our reformers very, very often this yes. is not. It's not I the mean, case. In, in many pilgrimage sites, just outside, there, there are like places to, to go and see prostitutes because the yes, pilgrims of course. arrive there and, yes. and then the, the other side of the pilgrimage is, is that one. No? So it's like it's also to deconstruct this uh, this, this division. No? Yeah. And um, I mean, I don't know, maybe there are also other questions uh, related to this because I'm fascinated by this <laughs> research so I could going to keep going and uh, ask a question, no? But, uh, yeah, um, I don't know. Is there anyone who wants to also ask a question? Mm -hmm. Or afterwards with the beer as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And also, I don't know. In a more intimate way. Yeah, when you're really bored, give us a sign, drop something, or... Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Um, in, in your words, it's quite fascinating how you combine, I mean, talking about the issues we are addressing, intimacy, uh, negotiation, being near, being far away. So you connect that and you expand the idea of space from the city till the most intimate space. Uh, the bed. Would you expand a bit? I mean, this issue. Can you add some words? I mean, we, we mm. of course. I mean, I think it's also maybe it's also a good way to connect it to um, 
one of the things you were also thinking about was how to connect it to Bolzano yeah. also. So maybe that's a, I was just reminded by the question. So I think one of the ways in which I got to this point was also when I started writing about the city and when I also started reading on migrant literature, like the poem I referenced, for example, Agas Oven, there's another fascinating writer, German, uh, a Turkish writer who writes in German. Her name is Amine Sevgi Özdemar. And I haven't, today I didn't read a scene that uh, references her work. Uh, but she is one of the most beautiful authors who've written about life in Germany as a migrant. And one of her stories, Der Hof im Spiegel, is a must read for anyone who wants to read on migrant. I mean, it's, you know, she's one of the top um, authors in what is called migrant literature in Germany. Um, and then she has, in this particular short story, she has, uh, she describes her life in an apartment with three mirrors. And what the three mirrors do is that they reflect other people's houses into her room. Um, and then she, and through the mirror, in the reflection in the mirror, she can also see what's happening in the hof, in the, in the, in the courtyard of the house. So the way she describes her narrative actually keeps flowing between what she is feeling, what she's seeing in the three mirrors, and then what she, the kinds of conversations she has with the mother on the phone. And on the phone she hears um, the, 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 the guy selling watermelon on the streets, so or the children playing in the little uh, street. So that is such a porous um, text in terms of, so authors like Abbas Ogun and, and um, and Sevgi um, or Uzdemar remind me, and also my own sort of ways of writing, that the migrant sense of time is quite complex <laughs> in terms of when, when you arrive in a new place, right? Or when you when you home in a new place. You cannot have a simple sense of time and place. It is by definition complex because it it involves and implicates multiple places, but I see it in the form of intimacy, an intimacy with history, intimacy with time, intimacy with place. So when you live in Berlin, but you can think of Karachi without making any effort, and you can think of another place or another time, or your own history, family history, or other, other forms of histories without making any effort, it means that the, that, that that horizon of the city is quite expansive, and it's quite easily expansive. So it's not that you really have to draw some kind of um, you know parallel between some places or something, but there's something quite obvious there and, and effortless. I feel. Um, so I think I don't know if it answers your question, but I think it it in these kinds of writings, but also my own sort of sense of longing and and in a place like Berlin, because I'm so attached to this place, I have emotional reasons for it. Um, but also it's a process, right? So I'm also wondering why at this point in my life did I start writing about Berlin, not immediately after coming to Berlin. I never wrote a diary about my life in Berlin or something, but somehow this project for all its reasons, and maybe it was also about the time when I started this project three, four years ago, it was already six years in Berlin. And there were certain kinds of intimacies, I would say, that pushed me, this encounter with another migrant community, who though were my neighbors for all the time that I've lived in my neighborhood, but I actually never really, I would have crossed paths with them on the street, but I never really spoke to them because our worlds are so different. And that's why class and those things are quite important. Even though I'm a migrant, I'm a very different kind of migrant. It's also something that I kept thinking about Bolzano, and you know, I mentioned this question of whiteness of the bed and in relation to the streets of Bolzano. Having arrived in the city, I think I was so much more conscious of my privilege as a kind of migrant I am in Europe because I don't see Pakistanis so often in Berlin on the streets. In Bolzano, you walk in the first, I mean, one of the first sounds I heard was Urdu and the Punjabi and Pashto languages that I recognize. Um, and the few, yeah, I was Verona in Verona on Sunday, like yesterday, and all I heard, all I saw was these refugees and, and migrants, um, and some in very bad shape, some, and they, somehow there were all these kinds of interactions. People would come and ask something, or would recognize me, or um, so I'm a lot more aware uh, of my, uh, my privilege when I'm in Bolzano, because I'm constantly 
in spaces where I don't find them. But I constantly see them on the streets. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's this question of access again. You know, who has access? How porous is the place? And how, who is it porous for? Is another question. So I can move very easily between all kinds of spaces, or fairly easily, even though I feel quite, you know, uh, sometimes the only person of color in a room. But on the streets, not so much. Uh, and I think that's also interesting on what levels does the city operate and what is the city, how does the city look to a migrant, right? So it's quite, it would be quite different if, a, if one of those migrants had the, the liberty, the luxury <laughs> to write about the experience in the city. Uh, I, of course, do, right, because of my privilege. So just to make that connection too, to, to, I think, uh, thinking about the city and thinking about um, privilege, access, somehow. Maybe um, one last thing is uh, uh, really one of the, the sentences that I like uh, more that really think, I think brings together with all of your research is this sentence I will read, of course, not as well as you did. <laughs> uh, when you say, in a place as insufficiently sacralized as Berlin, saints are also migrants of some kind, <laughs> subject to time, invisible to many, slithering across spaces, escaping intelligibility, present only to those who can see with eyes shut. And I really, I really like this because of course of what you were saying, no? that especially in spaces like Bolzano, migrants are really sometimes like saints, they remain hidden to to some because in certain spaces they do not have access mm. or they are there but they are invisible, no? Mm. Mm. Um, but for me what is also interesting and this of course comes from my research is that in fact saints are often migrants because every community has its saints, mm. no? And, uh, and sometimes they, they then steal the saint from another community and this is a sort of, of, of migrant <laughs> saint, no? Like for instance here in the villages, every village mm. has a patron saint and mm. this, is, uh, this is changing quickly now. But it's, it's, it's really true that these saints are migrating and now the, the, the people who are arriving here are bringing also their own pantheon, yeah, no? Sure. Mm. And, um, and so I think that this, this is analysis is, is really interesting and sh shows this, uh, yeah, this, this complex work that you are doing now of, of showing how, what happens in the dream, but uh, what in, in some way, even if in different mm -hmm. ways, but is happening also elsewhere now. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons I started thinking about that was also because because I've worked with the Sufi context in Pakistan, and as you would know, pilgrimage sites have to do with histories, right? Um, there have to be these long-standing histories of a place being sacralized, of a saint having visited that place, somebody remembering it and then memorializing it. So I worked in a landscape which was highly sacralized in Pakistan that you could not walk from one corner to the other without finding a shrine or a Sufi saint. Or, but I also knew the, the grammar. I knew how to locate saintly spaces in Pakistan because I knew the, the hints, whether it had to do with smell, whether it had to do with the flag, whether it had to do with the marker. There were these cues in urban space. You can walk through a lane and you can, you can see that there might be a shrine right behind you because I can smell fragrance or I can smell something. And when I started researching the Sufis in Berlin, I was struck by the fact that I have to find these people behind in hoofs and these mosques are like shy structures that are not on the main street and you have to somehow find a mosque, then you have to somehow find a ritual space. So I kept thinking, wow, I mean, how do you live in a place where you don't have these shrines, where you don't have a history where 100 years ago your, nobody was here from your community in a way. Mm -hmm. So how do you make a landscape sacralized when you don't have physical, tangible sites of pilgrimage or a holy landscape? And all that landscape is somewhere else. 
So somehow this whole ontological thing, this saintly imagination, allows for a kind of a landscape to also permeate, but also arrive here, but temporarily, because it's only in ritual, and it goes away. So people have these encounters, saints come, but as soon as the ritual is over, you go back home, you go back to, your, to the secular belief, or, you know, and you lose that. So this, this fragility of it is like the precarity of, of migrant life, and that's how I made that. That's a question, that's all. So I was curious about the genes. Uh, the genes, yeah. Yes, because as, I know, as far as I know, they are kind of uh, entities which are connected to maybe water or some natural <coughs> animals, let's say, and you don't need a shrine yeah. to go to visit them. And my question is, do you know how the are there new kinds of genes emerging in Berlin, and where are they located? Well, that's a very, <laughs> that's a research project. <laughs> we can write a proposal. <laughs> no, it's a very good question. What are the, what are the, what is the new brand of gins? Yeah. Uh, no, because usually when people migrate, the yes. perception of the world changes, and the yeah. police even at some point maybe the spirits change. Or like, I'm sure. So, I mean, I would say, that, so, so jinns are made of air, I think, in the Islamic imagination. And that's why they are so fast and they can, you know, travel everywhere, la la la. Uh, but the other thing about jinns, or the belief in jinns, is that they live exceptionally long lives. So you can meet a jinn today who was living in the time of Solomon or David or Muhammad, or one of the prophets. And that means that you have some access to that form of truth or some transmission. But jinns are also uh, seen as unreliable in the Islamic imagination. So there's even a theological discussion that if you hear something from a jinn, how true can it be? Like what is the percentage? There's a percentage to it. Because jinns get their information because they, they fly to the sky. I'm just now going to. Jinns go sky, fly towards the sky, but they cannot go beyond the first level of the sky. There are seven levels of heavens. And they can, they can go closer to the first level, and they eavesdrop on angels' conversations. So angels know what God is planning, or what's happening in the world, and the jinn hears that, and then comes. So the, the information is credible, but not fully reliable. So there's all that happening as well. But to, put to your question, I don't know. But it is quite possible, it is quite likely, that uh, jinns have... Um, modified personalities, or you know, have to do or they, 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 because they shape shift. They also shape shift in terms of um, the spirit of the time and the place that they are. So there has to be a, a very Berlin brand of hipster gins. I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised. But that is a project to be done, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with uh, Stefan and, and what you are saying because what happens in Portugal mm. is that actually Muslims and Hindus are going to Fatima pilgrimage because they say, okay, we don't have a Muslim ah. pilgrimage shrine here, but the closest thing that <laughs> resembles it is Fatima. No? That Fatima yeah. also has a, a Muslim name and it is an important female figure. Yes. So they go there and there is this whole kind of adaptation. No? So this is why I'm also saying that it's so interesting you know, to say that the saints are like the migrants because they actually ch mi migrate, migrate and change yes. and, and adapt. No? Mm. So I wouldn't be surprised if also in Berlin there is some sort of reappropriation of some uh, holy places that already exist in Berlin and that in some way can mm. be reinterpreted also as uh, especially Sufi, Sufi followers or Sufis are very creative in this uh, yes. sense. <laughs> And, uh, I, and I wouldn't be surprised if there would be also some crossovers with forms of, of new spiritualities, you know. Oh yes, the there are Sufis are very, yes. very yes. fashionable for new spiritualities. Oh yes, so. yes. I don't work with those groups, but my, one of my friends does, and there is a whole scene of, uh, they're called universal Sufis, and yeah, they do all these kinds of new religious techniques, and where everyone is involved, whether you're Christian, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, and they, yeah. There is that scene, certainly. There's no more questions.
we can go over to the informal conversations and grab a beer. Yes. Thank you so much. For Thank you so much. Thank you.